appreciate the opportunity to talk this evening about some of the resources that we have at the at the public library specifically on this topic tonight food waste and composting so first let me i'm just going to take a few minutes and cover a few things but i want to let you know there is a a resource guide that cedar has posted a link to on the Ottertail County Solid Waste website that's going to cover some of these items that I'm talking about tonight, a few additional ones. And I do want to let you know that that is certainly not a comprehensive list. It's just kind of a selection. And there are a lot more things available at the libraries in Ottertail County. There, there are four public libraries in Ottertail County. Um, and probably, and I'm sure from whatever um, library that's closest to you, if they don't have the particular item you need, most libraries have interlibrary loan and can find that thing for you. So I just want to kind of give a plug there that stop into your public library and see what they can offer and what they can get for you. But with that said, let me just tell you a couple of the things that we have in our libraries in our tail county and at the Perm Public Library um, that kind of pertain to our topic tonight. And the first book I want to mention to you is a great book called The Waste-Free Kitchen Handbook. And we were really fortunate to get copies of this donated actually by Cedar and Ottertail County Solid Waste in, in Ottertail County at our library. This is a great resource. It covers everything on how to reduce the amount of waste coming out of your kitchen. So it covers meal planning, it covers shopping, recipes, what to do with food scraps, um, it also has a really neat section kind of back here in the back that talks about how to store your food so that you can get a longer life out of the food that you buy rather than if you miss the first three days of those raspberries and you have to throw them away. So this is Waste Free Kitchen Handbook by Dana Gunders. This is an awesome resource. This is available in book format, print book, but it's also one of our ebook selections and our ebook service. So just to let people know about this, check this one out. Um, but then going on, did you know that there are recipe books specifically for how to cook with food leftover or food waste? Now this particular book is called Scraps, Wilt, and Weeds, but we also have another one called Cooking with Scraps, um, and it sounds maybe kind of disgusting, but if you, <laughs> if you like cookbooks and looking at recipe books, these are beautiful books. They have awesome photographs. They have some great ideas for the things you can make out of um, items that maybe you've already used part of it and you would normally throw away, but they're still good things. So here's a recipe for overripe blueberry banana pancakes. I think that sounds great. Um, there's also a recipe in here for coffee grounds biscotti. So, I mean, I think that sounds good too. So um, check out some of these recipe books and there's a couple listed on that resource guide and there's more in your public library as well. Um, just to go on to composting, composting is kind of a really popular thing in our area, I've found. And there's a number of books that talk about composting. Now, this particular one is called Composting Sustainable and Low Cost Techniques for Beginners, and it's by Janet Wilson. But there's a number of other ones as well out there. And they talk about um, varying composting methods, what you can compost, maybe what you shouldn't compost, and then also how to use that compost in your garden. So check out some of these as well. We also have lots of children's books and children's books at different reading levels. So to kind of stick with that composting idea, here's a book called Compost, exclamation point, by Linda Glazer. And this is written for very young children. It's kind of like a picture book format to read to your very young children to encourage them with gardening and composting in the garden. So we have books like that, but then we also have this one called Composting, Turn Food Waste into Rich Soil. And this is designed for a little bit older child who's actually maybe going to be doing some of that work in the garden. And then we have lots of children's books that talk about 
I can reduce waste. So if you want to introduce your child to this idea of reducing waste in your kitchen and creating a sustainable world as they go forward, there's lots of books like that as well. So I wanna really draw your attention to those. The last things I do wanna mention is we have some DVDs that are really great. One of them is called Wasted. The Story of Food Waste. This was a movie that was produced by Anthony Bourdain, and it's really an interesting movie. Um, it outlines the problems of food waste. It shows how food waste is contributing to our climate change, and it also talks about how restaurateurs and chefs are trying to reduce some of the food waste in their, in their restaurants and their businesses. And so this is just a great overview, and it really brings home to you the issue. Um, now this one is a little different. It's a little more fun. It's called Just Eat It. And this is a movie um, where the, the movie makers, um, Jen and Grant, I think, they decide that they realize that food waste is a thing and it's a contributing to climate change and they want to make a difference. And so they pledge to quit grocery shopping and survive only on discarded food. So there you go. If you really want to take that next step, <laughs> check out this movie. So those are just the things I want to kind of point out to you, some of the fun things that you can find at the library, also some of the informational resources. So I hope you have a great evening and enjoy the program. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. I just, I want to go check out books now and especially that kids composting one because I need to involve my kids more. So that is awesome. All right, well, we will get, oops, oh, that's okay. Something got wonky here, there we go. Um, so just a really quick review. Um, God, I'm still distracted by the books. Oh, and they're on our website. So I will, I'll just pull that up very quickly. I forgot that I was going to do that. Do, 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 just so you can see where those things are. So on the Waste Free Degree website, if you just scroll down, I've actually been throwing some resources under each topic. So actually from last week, there's that disposal guide. If you want more information on where specific things go, there, the app is actually on our main page linked there. Someone had asked about different legislation or things that were happening in terms of um, trying to make some change more like the systemic level. And so there is right now in Minnesota, a landfill responsibility act that's trying to um, really reduce landfilling and then emphasize reusing and recycling more. So that's information on that from the MPCA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, there's also some like state funding and possible legislation that's gonna happen around PFAS and that's polyfluoral chlorine compounds. Um, it's something like, I'm probably not saying it right, but that's an emerging contaminant of concern. So any, any kind of chemical that's in your products you buy ends up in the waste stream. And so they're finding this compound, um, which is harmful to human health and the environment. They're finding it in leachate, which is the liquid from the bottom of landfills. They're finding it at commercial compost facilities. Um, and so there's some interesting information about that. Um, if we go down to food waste and compo composting, um, you can kind of look at this later, but here's that list from Susan that had all those awesome things on it, plus a few more. There's our composting webpage. I'm gonna reference the NR, the National Resources Defense Council wasted uh, report on wasted food. They've also got a great webpage. A blog post that I thought was interesting on, um, we don't need to eat, you know, kind of a lot of variety because that can actually lead to waste. So there's some interesting benefits on that. He's a minimalism blogger that I really like. And there's some great recipes too about root to stem cooking, which I'll reference in a little bit. So just so people know where the, those are. And there we go. So just a really fast review. Last week we talked about what's in your garbage, where it goes. Um, your garbage is really just full of lots of natural resources and we wanna use waste like a resource. We don't just wanna throw it away like it has no value. It has a lot of value. Um, sometimes even, even it's worth money, like aluminum cans that we throw away anyway. 
And if we put that all in a landfill, that's like a tomb. It's not getting in or out. All that is, is lost to us. Um, waste energy is good because it reduces the volume of your garbage that we need to send to landfill. Recycling conserves resources, but it's not quite enough. Um, it often just delays landfilling, downcycles things, um, and recycling still uses energy and a lot of infrastructure. And so we need, really need to think about waste prevention before. So this is a great quote. Um, Dana Gunders actually was the author of that waste-free kitchen handbook that Susan had held up. And so she actually was the primary author on the NRDC uh, wasted food report that came out in 2012 and 2017. It's linked to, I if you want more information, I would highly recommend going and checking that out. It's very readable and it's just, it's really stunning um, the information that's in there. So I love this quote. Imagine walking out of a grocery store with four bags of groceries, dropping one in the parking lot and not bothering to pick it up. That's essentially what we're doing in our homes today. So um, that just really encapsulates for me just how much money really that people are throwing away when they, when they waste food. So we waste about 40% of the food we produce in the United States. And we did a waste audit in 2000, winter of 2019, helped by um, a Green Corps member um, that we had at the time. And so this image of the wasted food on the plate, what, it, it's really appalling. Um, and actually the amount of organic waste in the garbage has gone up. So we pulled so many meals worth of food, not just scraps that you wouldn't have eaten, but actual like whole heads of lettuce, whole packages of celery, never touched, whole bags of grapes, um, potatoes that look like you'd, you could still cook them, whole hamburgers and buns. Um, so just for fun, we actually plated a few meals with um, the food waste that we found there. And really food waste made up like 26% of the residential garbage um, in a neighborhood of Fergus Falls. So we hand sorted an entire truck full of garbage from a neighborhood. So uh, we will do that again in the future. So if you're interested in volunteering, it is kind of dirty and a little smelly, but it's fascinating. Um, and the people that volunteer to help us with that usually come back and do it again. So um, this is from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So just based on most kind of recent waste audit data from there, we are getting a little better at recycling. So the amount of paper in the waste stream has gone down, but a lot more things are coming in. Plastic is just, plastic is just blowing up. Like, even though there's a lot more concern about plastic in the waste stream, people are very concerned about it, more and more is being produced. So you can really see that reflected in these numbers. So the amount of plastic in the waste stream has gone up. The amount of organic waste that is thrown away with your trash is now at about 30%. So that has increased. And we also saw that over separate years of the residential waste audit in Fergus Falls as well. So despite um, improved and maturing recycling programs, Minnesotans are wasting more than ever. Um, per capita waste generation just keeps going up. That's why this is so important. And I'm so glad that people are interested in this. So here's the results or the, the answer to that first polling question. And you guys were spot on. Most of you said, most of food waste is from home. About 43% of food waste is actually uh, in households. So that's really amazing. And we're wasting a lot of money on wasted food, but it also means that each individual can really make an impact if you um, do some work around reducing food waste in your home. So some on farms, some in, in grocery stores, some in restaurants, a little bit in institutional settings, um, but really at home, that's that's a really big opportunity for, for us at the individual level. Um, and there's a lot of costs to this. So we're wasting like 1.3% of our GDP. That, that's how much money in food waste um, dollars wise. So that would average out to about $1,800 for a family of four every year, $34 a week. So there's probably a lot more the average family would uh, want to do with that money than throw it out in the garbage. Um, and it's enough energy every year to power the whole country for a week. So because of that, food waste actually causes enough emissions to, to be, to create more emissions, greenhouse gas emissions than most countries. So only below China and the United States. So we're really feeding landfills and we're feeding climate change, 
you know, almost as much as we feed people, which just is um, really not a good thing. And then all the human labor, the human energy, the human hands working on growing that food, packaging that food, driving that food around, that, that represents a huge loss in human effort as well. Um, that food loss also represents uh, natural resources, enough land that we could feed all the hungry people around the world. Um, hunger is really a distribution problem, not a scarcity problem. A lot of our freshwater resources are gone when we waste food. And then we're losing that soil fertility. We're growing food, taking nutrients out of the soil and then putting it into landfills. So we need to put in, be putting that back into the soil as well. And we do it because we can. For the average, uh, you know, maybe middle class family anyway, um, food is relatively cheap and, and we have a lot of access to it. So when, when it doesn't cost you a lot in relative terms, um, you, you tend to waste more. That's true for a lot of products. Cheap things lead to waste. But yet 43% of Americans are food insecure. So it's, it's a conundrum. Uh, we waste because we don't store things very well. So hence the A to Z storage guide on the website or some of the resources that Susan mentioned. Um, you know, and this could even be rotating inventory in a restaurant fridge or at a grocery store. That's why they're trying to rotate product and, and, and rotate it on shelves. We reject ugly food. So in that um, wait, story of food waste um, video that's available at the Purim Library, Tristram, um, what is his name? Stewart, I think is his name. That's right. He's kind of a famous guy uh, because he's done a lot of work, work around food waste. And so this is a pile of bananas that were rejected from being sold in stores and distributed because they were the wrong shape or had the wrong curvature. And so massive amounts of food waste is generated by kind of perfectionism and wanting our food to be perfect. And so when you're at the store, like buy the weird shaped bananas or buy the, you know, I don't know, lemon that has a scar on the side. It's not gonna matter. It's not gonna taste different, um, but really it's, it's kind of because of consumer demand that we want something that looks perfect because we, you know, don't want things that'll spoil, but it leads to a lot of food waste. Confusion over date labeling. And most people just don't realize how much food they waste. Most people think that they waste less food, um, but that's impossible. So, so quick tips for reducing your food waste. And these are all on a fun magnet. So if you want a fight food waste magnet for your fridge with all these tips I'm gonna share with you, you can get that from me. So look at it and measure it. All these tips are actually from the uh, Food Too Good to Waste program that was developed by the EPA and that our Green Corps member last year helped implement um, um, in partnership actually with some area libraries. So when you look at it and you measure it, you're more um, likely to try and reduce it. So you know maybe that's being really formal about it. Maybe that's just paying a little bit closer attention. This is me weighing my food for that uh, Food Too Good to Waste program last year and just being really disappointed because um, I'm a waste educator. I feel like I should have a handle on this and yet there's a lot of food waste in my house too. So we can all do better. Um, so yeah, we underestimate it. Collect it, weigh it, just look at it. Remember that is resources and money that you are throwing out. Understand food dating. So about 20% of food waste is actually because of people not really understanding what those dates mean. So best buy and sell by dates really are, are not indicators of food safety. Um, they're un, totally unregulated, completely inconsistent among brands. And they're often very, very conservative and indicate when a product is at its peak quality, but not safety. So really use common sense, use your senses, smell it, look at it, taste it, um, and use safe food handling practices to, to help reduce that food waste. This is a picture of a bunch of meat. Somebody probably had cleared old stuff out of their freezer and this was dumped in a recycling bin last year. So um, we see a lot of this come through even though clearly the recycling bin is not the right place for canned goods and frozen meat. Make an eat it up shelf in your fridge. Put stuff on there that's open, that might be about to go bad. Put your leftovers on there. Just any way you can get that more visible to yourself you're more likely to eat it. So anything, of course, buried at the back of the fridge, 
uh, or at the bottom of your deep freeze and it's much more likely to go to waste. Shop your kitchen, take a look around. What has been sitting in the back of your pantry forever? Um, get creative, maybe try a new recipe, substitute something that you already have. Um, and then just some interesting recipes that I did link to would be for root to stem cooking. So things like um, carrot top um, pesto, which is in the picture here. Um, I can't think of another example right now or things from apple peels. So there's a lot of ways you can use more parts of the plant than you might um, normally think. Plan ahead, always go with the list. Anytime you're gonna pluck something up because, oh, maybe I wanna use that um, impulse buys, thinking you're gonna eat healthier than you actually do. You know, at only, buy what you're actually gonna eat. So sticking to a, a list really helps with that. Make friends with your freezer. The freezer is a great resource, store food properly. This is my really crowded fridge last year. That is not good. Usually it's not quite that bad. Um, and know how to store stuff. So check out that storage guide. Herbs, lettuce, celery, a lot of things do better sitting upright in a like a jar of water, like a, maybe a mason jar or something. And things like basil and tomatoes hate the, fr hate the fridge. So, you know, just knowing how to store stuff properly can really help. I, um, my family's not good at eating bananas some weeks. Some weeks we eat them all, some weeks nobody wants to touch them. I don't know, that's just life. So I just throw them in my freezer. So at any given time, I probably have about 15 to 25 frozen bananas in my freezer. And then I'll just make like a sextuple batch of banana bread um, because I don't want those bananas, which were probably grown in some tropical location and flown or shipped all the way up to cold Minnesota in the winter. I do not wanna throw all those resources that were in that food out with the trash. So I'm gonna freeze that and I'm gonna use it later when I have time. And just being aware, think, think about making a commitment to yourself and you could even write it down. You could, um, it does say on the bottom of the magnet, that's the last tip on this magnet list. Commit to eating all the food you buy. Maybe that's reminders for yourself, putting that on, that on the fridge. Maybe it's just liking some, some groups on Facebook that would pop up periodic topics on this, subscribing to some blogs, um, anything like that to kind of keep, keep you thinking about this as a topic will be helpful. So we're gonna prevent as much food waste as we can like that. And then we're gonna compost what we can't eat. So at the very least, if we can't prevent that waste, we're gonna turn it back into nutrient rich soil or compost that we're gonna then use to grow new plants. All right. And again, I haven't been checking the chat yet, but feel free to throw um, questions in the chat. Let's see. Oh, no questions in the chat yet. We'll get to that. So when you're thinking about composting, and there's a lot of composters on here, again, maybe in the chat, share what you do, share what, what works for you, because it's, it's not a one size fits all situation. So not everyone is gonna want some massive three bin system in your backyard. So if you have just a little bit of food waste or maybe you live in an apartment or you don't have a backyard or a big enough backyard to backyard compost, you might wanna try out composting worms. We actually have some here at the Ottertail County Recycling Center. They don't smell if you're managing it right. They're a lot less work than a backyard compost bin and you don't um, need to turn it. You don't need to add lots of dry leaves, which we'll talk about. So, you know, that might be a better solution for some people who don't care about getting a usable compost product at the end. If you desire loads and loads of compost for your garden later, then you probably want a multi-bin system. You probably want to stockpile all your leaves or get your hands on some cheap wood chips or lots of free shredded paper because you're going to need a lot of material because um, it does shrink down when it composts. If you're somewhere in the middle like me, you're probably gonna fill a bin and flip it or turn it, you know, maybe two to three times a year. Um, that's kind of where my family is at. We have way too much for just a worm bin. Um, I could use some compost, but I don't have a huge garden at my house, but um, I save some of my leaves to add to my compost bin, so. All right, just a quick note. So like I mentioned last time, there's people that think that when they put stuff in the landfill, it kind of decomposes or rots away. It's not happening. 
So in a landfill, there's no oxygen. So if you are into biology or have taken biology, anaerobic is the term for the kind of decomposition that happens when there's no oxygen. Landfills are totally sealed off. Garbage is sealed in those cells. The only bacteria that are in there are anaerobic bacteria. They can survive without oxygen, but the byproduct of anaerobic decomposition is methane, which is a greenhouse gas about, I don't know, 20 to 60 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So food waste in the landfill is not good, um, especially in terms of climate change. And it happens really slow. You can still find food in there that looks like the same as when it went in 20 years ago. It's extremely slow. Composting is decomposition with oxygen. You want air in there and that's gonna feed the kind of uh, microorganisms that you want. So it's basically feeding the life in the soil. I can't remember how many billion organisms are in one teaspoon of soil, but it's actually a lot. So little microbes consume that organic waste and in turn return some of those nutrients back into the soil. And then other invertebrates like worms or um, you know, even fly larva, things like that will help break down bigger things into small things. So that's kind of the difference there and why you want to be turning your compost pile because that's gonna add air. All right, we're doing okay on time. Woohoo, we'll have time for chatting at the end. I'm gonna peek at the chat here because I see something popped in there. Mmm, yes. So somebody asked, a number of years ago, Becker County was selling composting bins and that's when they started. Is this something Ottertail County could do to help promote composting? Absolutely. So we actually last year had a small amount of bins from Becker County, they had extra. And so we actually got a stack from them and sold them in a small sale last spring. And then this spring, we were part of a larger sale with the Recycling Association of Minnesota, who runs the sale that Becker County had been a part of too. So we actually, but we sold out within three days. So we just did a compost bin sale. Um, that's much like the bin shown on this picture, but we sold out in three days. So that tells me there's a lot more demand for this than we thought. And so next year we will offer a lot more of those um, because that's great. People wanna compost and keep their food waste out of the landfill. So that's wonderful news for me. So that's a great question though. We did it. It was so popular. I barely had time to promote it. So, and then there was a question earlier too uh, that I didn't get to. Recycle cookie wrappers, plastic trays, clamshell trays and containers. Yes. Um, cookie wrappers, no. Anything that's a film wrapper, and I wish I had an example right here, but if you're opening a Snickers bar or a granola bar, that kind of wrapper is not recyclable. Um, but sometimes the plastic trays, like if you have Oreos and there's the plastic tray, so you, you throw away the wrapper that goes around the Oreos, the plastic tray inside it may be recyclable depending on if there's a number in on that package with the recycling symbol. Um, that can be kind of tricky. Sometimes they're, they're different numbers. A, a number six, technically we accept it, but it's not as recyclable as a number one, a number two, or a number five. So clamshell trays and containers, yes, as long as they're not styrofoam. If you have a big black composting bin in the, like in the picture, what is a good way to turn it? I'll be talking about that. Oh, awesome. And somebody said we lift ours up and move it. That's exactly what I do. So let's talk about that. I'm gonna close this. Whoops, go back, go back. There we go. So just three main steps. You're gonna get a bin. We'll talk about a few options. You're gonna layer it in there like lasagna, and then you're gonna turn it or mix it. And there's various ways to do that. So there are so many options. So if you wanted a compost bin like in that sale, um, even with a discount, they were still 50 bucks. So you, you could wait till next year and get one of those. They're, they're nice. This is exactly the one that I have at home. It was a little different in the sale this year, but they work great. If you don't wanna wait until next year, there's lots of other options. Um, so depend, depending on where you are and if you need it to be covered or not. If you're worried about critters, you're gonna wanna cover. If you live maybe outside of town and you don't need to worry about critters, whoop de doo if some squirrels or maybe a raccoon comes along and takes a nibble, probably not as big of a deal unless you really are bothered by that. So a pallet bin, something like that would be pretty much free. 
um, for a while, I just had a circle of chicken wire and it was a little sloppy, but I didn't care at the time. So it's, it's pretty easy to turn. You probably want a pitchfork. You can get a tumbler. These are very popular because nobody wants to turn their compost pile. They tend to be expensive. This, these are probably more along the lines of $100 to $200. Um, I often feel like they don't maybe have enough volume to really heat up, get enough microbial activity to get hot. Um, you, you want that microbial activity to make sure that things are decomposing and that byproduct of that is heat. So that when people say it gets hot, that's why. Um, so they're expensive, they're neater. You don't need to turn them yourself. I'm just not convinced. We have a ball shape here that I actually can roll around and it just does not work that well for me. So maybe this works for some people. I'm just not a fan. This is just my personal preference. It's expensive and I just don't feel like I can get enough in there. I would fill that way too quick and then I don't know, I'd be out of luck. You can make one yourself. These might have a little more capacity, very inexpensive. You would drill some holes in the top or the bottom. You don't need a pitchfork, but it's heavy. Just like the ball I have here, which is about three feet across, um, it's actually a ball that I can roll around on the grass. It's really hard to roll. If there's enough stuff in there to make compost, it's really hard to roll because it's so heavy. So I, I prefer this one on the right, but that's just me. And um, I have a setup very much like this because I make a lot of compost and I'm lazy and so it doesn't go very fast because I don't turn it very often. But I do have a leaf stockpile, much like shown here. I have another pallet bin next to it that's for half finished compost that animals no longer care about. And then I have the black covered bin like we sell in the compost bin sale for Otter Tail County for the more fresh stuff that I'm adding to that an animal might want to get into and that's what I put a lid on. All right, let me peek at the chat for more questions. Mm, best way to compost during the winter. You layer it in and then you wait till spring because it's gonna be frozen solid most likely unless you really have a big pile. That's okay though, freezing and then thawing makes stuff very, very mushy. So then when it thaws out in the spring, it might be a little wet at first. You're gonna mix some more dry stuff in there, which we'll cover here. Um, and then you're good to go. So it's okay, it'll just be frozen for a while maybe. And, and that's just fine. Great, awesome. Somebody says they compost all winter. That's exactly what I did. Mine is very full and I can't wait for it to thaw so I can flip it over. Awesome, yep, perfect you guys. Somebody has a tumbler and wasn't impressed. <laughs> yeah. Let me know if you get that to work. I just am skeptical myself, but let me know. <laughs> All right, so what can you compost? A lot of you are already composting, so you probably know this. So anything, people refer to green materials and dry and brown materials. Um, green materials are more wet and they have a lot of nitrogen in them. So this would be your fruit and veggie scraps, um, grains and bread, peels, pits, flowers, stems, um, green grass clippings even, things that are more fresh are gonna have more nitrogen. You really need to balance that out with brown dry stuff. If you have too much wet green stuff, like all food waste in your compost pile, it will be wet and smelly and slimy and you're not gonna feel very happy about it. So um, you're gonna want a lot of brown dry materials that's gonna add carbon into your compost pile. So I stockpile a lot of leaves in a bin I made out of pallets because I hate putting them in plastic bags and putting them on the curb. I just save a lot of them for my own compost pile because I need that much too to balance out my food waste. You can also use wood chips, shredded paper, or straw. But no meat, don't dump oil in there, no dairy products like cheese or milk or yogurt, no bones unless you really want critters um, or you don't care about smelly compost, but it's, it's gonna smell more, it might attract some skunks or raccoons or something and it's just not good. All right. Now you've got, you're gonna collect your stuff. I have a metal pail in my kitchen. I have a metal pail in our break room at work. So I collect my food waste and then I layer it in just like this diagram. You don't want food showing because that's gonna attract critters. You wanna really have a lot of dry brown carbon material as compared to your food waste or green wet nitrogen material. So this diagram is the best one I have ever found. 
I basically fill up my entire compost bin in layers like this, maybe a little less leaves in the winter if I just don't have enough. And then I mix them in again later, but I fill up my whole compost, compost bin just like this. Let's see if anybody else says they do that. Oh, ratio, yes. Yep, so this ratio, um, you know, some people say 30 to one. I, I feel like that would be so many leaves, like, I don't know. So when I dump my pail in, I put two big handfuls about the size of the pail in. So I'm doing about two to one just by size. You know, I, I don't get very exact about it, um, but you definitely want more dry than you want green. Um, that's gonna help make sure there's air in it to feed those aerobic microbes, right, grubs that are be gonna making your compost. Um, and it's gonna make sure it's not too wet. So printer paper that is shredded, you know, it can be, it might have a few more chemicals in it. So I, I think, you know, shredded cardboard or newsprint might be better, um, but you know, it, it's kind of up to the individual. I haven't done a lot of research on that. I usually just use a lot of leaves. I save my leaves. All right, and then you mix it up. So you can certainly do the pitchfork method, but as someone said in the chat, um, if I've got my whole plastic three by three cubic foot bin full of layers, there is no way I'm gonna try and stick a pitchfork in the top of that and stir it. That's the part that has never worked for me. Um, maybe it works for some people. It might work better for a pallet bin like this guy is using. You can get in from the side, lift those layers and turn them over. Um, but for me, I lift the entire bin off to reveal all those lasagna layers. I set the bin next to it and I flip it all the way back in or I flip it into a pallet bin next to it because once it's partially broken down, animals seem to stop caring about it. You know, they want that fresh food you've just dumped in there, not the stuff that's already half decomposed. So that's usually when I flip it into an open bin and then I start filling up and making compost lasagna in the empty bin again. So this is gonna help distribute stuff. You need some air in there. If it's really smelly and wet, flip it over, add some more leaves or shredded paper, get that air in there, get the moisture distributed and it's gonna decompose faster. So this gets, oh, and I know we're almost out of time. This is, gets a little sciencey, so I'm not gonna talk about it much. There's a lot of research and, and information on how often to turn it. I am lazy. I don't turn mine until it's full. Therefore, my compost actually breaks down quite slow. I could be a lot more active with it and probably get results faster. So here, it's showing that in the early stages of compost, your pile is gonna heat up because thermophilic or heat-loving bacteria kind of take over the pile at that point. And that's when a lot of decomposition activity is happening. So if you were to turn it and do a good job and have enough compost in one pile, you know, you might really see some results within uh, 40 days, maybe 60 days. Uh, but for me, it takes actually a couple of months probably because I'm, I'm just, I don't put a lot of time into it and I'm okay with that. If you want faster results, um, turning it more often, especially in that first month or so, um, will help it break down faster. Using it, when it's done, it's gonna be dark, crumbly, and smell kind of good. Again, it takes me a little longer, probably not four weeks for me, um, but definitely not 12 months. So, you know, it really depends on your approach. Most of you probably know the benefits, but it's gonna add nutrients back into your soil, increase moisture retention in your soil. You can mix it into garden beds. You can rake it over low spots in your lawn, mix it with potting soil, use it as mulch. Um, there's just a lot of great ways you can use it. Even if you don't have a garden, you can use that compost. So what can you do? Definitely don't feed the landfills. That was a great um, project done by some parks. Um, instead of don't feed the wildlife, don't feed the landfills. So reduce your food waste, shop your kitchen, plan ahead, make a list, create that eat first shelf in your fridge, use your freezer, even for herbs. You can freeze herbs in little bits of water, it's awesome. And just make that commitment. I'm gonna eat everything that I buy. I'm not gonna waste money and I'm not gonna feed the landfills. And then compost what you can't eat. And stay up to date on disposal information. Next week, refusing and reusing, one of my favorite topics, same link. 
So let's go ahead and throw some more stuff in the chat. Let me know what works for you when you're composting or questions. Let's see. Somebody is asking, where can you get shredded newsprint or cardboard? We don't get any newspapers. That's a great question. Um, so you, you could shred up cardboard or even probably put layers of cardboard maybe, maybe in your compost pile. Many people don't get newspapers anymore. If you live close to the recycling center, you can actually stop in and pick up newspapers. Our staff would be help, happy to help you, you know, fill a box with newspapers and take them home for that very purpose. We also get a lot of shredded paper here. Um, can people get compost anywhere for gardens in the county, like finished compost? Some of our yard waste sites you can get compost from, but it's not actively managed. So it's not going to be maybe um, as beneficial as, as you might want. I heard that the city of Fergus Falls site, they do a really good job of managing their yard waste site. So they do have more usable compost there that you can get. Um, citrus foods. I do compost citrus foods. I've also heard, you know, don't, don't do too much citrus, but you know, even if it's not ideal, I would rather put that in my compost bin than put it in a landfill. So I tend to kind of break a few small rules or bend some rules just because I really don't want that to go to a landfill. Moldy foods are great. So mold, fungi, bacteria, all are part of that decomposer family that's going to help break stuff down. So moldy bread, that's already started decomposing. So moldy foods are fine in my book. Never moved it. Okay. Somebody has put a shovel in and tried to mix it up. The black bin has a door at the bottom that slides up and pull the finished compost at the bottom. Not sure if the newer ones have that. So that's the exact bin that I have. Um, if it was one of the pictures I showed earlier, that's exactly what I have. I have never once used the door on that because in that bin, I can't stir it with a pitchfork. So I'm just filling the whole thing, pulling the entire bin off at the end and flipping all that material over at once. Um, I'm, if, if somebody else has used the little door and pulled out the finished stuff at the bottom, you let me know, but I'm not, <laughs> I have not been able to do that. Um, the newer ones, I believe they also have a door at the bottom. So the compost bin sale we had this year, I think still has the door at the bottom. It also comes in two pieces. So you can take off one side um, and probably more easily access the material in there without removing the entire bin like I do. Yes, chickens. Of course, feeding animals with food is, is actually even um, higher up in, in terms of preference. So you want to first... Um, eat all the food you can and prevent food waste. Then you want to try and feed um, excess food to people. Then you want to try and feed excess food to animals, food that's not fit for people. Then you want to compost it. So that is great. Having chickens, you know, most everybody used to have chickens or a hog or whatever, and food waste was just turned into more food. And now that most of us don't live on farms, it's kind of an, uh, a problem. We're not managing it very well. Yeah, citrus seems to take a long time. I agree. Um, and you know, if it bothers you, you could leave citrus out. I, I'm okay with bumpy compost, <laughs> but I, I'm, not, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm kind of lazy about my compost, but I think what's really important to remember is, you know, it's just gonna go faster or slower. It's not going to not compost. It might take a long time. So I don't manage mine very actively. So it takes a lot longer, but guess what? It still breaks down. So if you filled up that compost bin and flat out forgot about it for an entire year, it probably is fine and it's just gonna be compost. It's just gonna take longer because you're not mixing it and that's okay. It's just, you can't really do it wrong. It just is faster or slower depending on how actively you wanna manage it. Yes, to speed up the heat having it in something black, whether that's a black compost bin, a black piece of, piece of plastic, like um, Paul here was saying, if you're trying to get it to heat up, maybe now even when it's, um, you know, wanting it to thaw out. Eggshells are awesome. So um, I often crush mine before I put them in my little compost bucket in the kitchen. Otherwise they kind of stay whole for a while. So if I crush them, they break down a lot faster, but that's gonna add that calcium um, and minerals back to the soil. So that's great. Eggshells are good. All right, any other questions anybody wants to throw in there? 
I'm so excited to see how many of you composted. So that's great. Grass clippings. Yes. Um, grass clippings are fine. They would more be in that green, wet nitrogen category. Um, anything that's fresh vegetation like that is going to be in that category where you're going to need to balance it out with a lot of dry brown material like dry leaves, dry grass clippings, shredded paper, wood chips, things like that. Absolutely. Well, I know we are just a few minutes past time. Um, somebody chops up their citrus, that's awesome. And it's true, I've read a lot of things where, you know, some people even run stuff food through the food processor. I don't, um, hence it probably takes my stuff longer to break down. But the smaller you chop stuff, the faster it's gonna decompose. So again, it's just how hands-on do you wanna be for your unique situation? Um, and it will affect how fast it goes, but if you're like me and you don't care, <laughs> it'll compost eventually. Um, you can be more hands-off, but if you want it to go faster and you want that more consistent product, you can be more hands-on. The awesome magnet is available. I think everybody can still see me as I'm holding this up. Is still available. There we go. You can just stop by my office. If you don't live near Fergus Falls, you can um, shoot me an email and I would be happy to find another way to get this to you. Um, I can even drop a stack of these off at, at libraries so that um, anyone you know around the county could pick one up. They're just free. So maybe I will do that. And then if anybody wants to stop in or let me know, I can make sure you get one. We have a lot of them because we did a lot of food waste events last year, but then a lot of stuff got canceled because of COVID. So we had extra supplies afterward. So let me know. Thank you so much for joining. I'm really excited to see all of you next week.